Right, good afternoon everyone. I think we'll make a start. Um, there's a lot of you signed in now, so we'll, we'll get going. Um, there is an option um, on your screen to ask questions. Um, I would ask that you'd wait until the end uh, and then I'll go through them um, and answer as many as I can. Um, otherwise it's a bit tricky answering them um, as we go through. There we go. Okay, so um, today's webinar is not too dissimilar in layout uh, from the last one um, that I did um, in terms of what we're covering, but the topic, of course, uh, is completely different. And today we're going to focus on tibialis posterior dysfunction. Um, so, first of all, um, when you look through the literature or you look through books or, or people write down um, diagnoses, um, some will refer to it as um, tib post dysfunction and others as post tib dysfunction. Now, I tend to find that if I read too much about it or if I write about it for too long, um, I end up finding myself inadvertently skipping uh, from one term to another, which may, uh, may end up, maybe what I end up doing uh, today. So apologies for that in advance. Um, in actual fact, if we're going to be very picky about this, that, um, it should be um, tibialis posterior um, dysfunction because it's the tibialis posterior muscle um, and it's the posterior tibial nerve. So if anyone read my last blog, they'll notice that I kept slipping between the two terms um, and a very good orthotist friend of mine took great delight in contacting me afterwards and correcting me on that. So if you're listening, you know who you are. Um, but joking aside, I think it's sort of important to know the difference really. Um, so in today's webinar, uh, for the next 45 minutes or so, uh, we're going to look at anatomy, um, causes, risk uh, factors, management um, and so on of the condition. So basically, tib post dysfunction can encompass a whole spectrum of different conditions um, and they can go anything from uh, tendosynovitis, uh, which is an inflammation of the tendon, usually the sheath, um, to a tendinosis, um, and that's a de degeneration of the tendon without inflammation. So it's the osis that gives it away there. If it's an osis, um, it's without inflammation. If it's an isis, it's with inflammation. Um, and then it can work its way through to a complete rupture. Uh, so the, the important thing with this is, and I will repeat this a lot during the presentation, um, is that um, we need to catch it early uh, where possible to prevent it getting worse. Now if you look at the picture and look at the anatomy, uh, you can see, or you should just about be able to see there, that the, the tib post passes around the back of the ankle um, and it's distal to the medial malleolus. Um, the tendon then divides into three. Uh, the, the anterior portion, which is the biggest part, uh, inserts into the navicular and the plantar first cuneiform, um, but it also branches uh, to the sustenticulum tali, the calcaneus, uh, the plantar surfaces of all three cuneiforms and the bases of the second, third and fourth metatarsals. But, um, I mean, in some people there are anatomical variations, um, so it's not always um, exactly like that, but, but the main part, as I said, is um, the bit that inserts into the navicular. It's also innervated by the tibial nerve L4 and L5 and it's supplied by the perineal artery um, at the top and the posterior uh, tibial artery towards uh, the bottom. Uh, its origin is, is uh, way up on the lateral part of the posterior surface of the tibia, uh, the proximal two-thirds of the medial surface of the fibula, the interosseous membrane and the intermuscular septa and the deep fascia. So I've just put a couple of photos in there, not photos, but pictures in there just so you can get a general idea of, of how far uh, up it goes. Uh, uh, actions wise, the purpose of this muscle is to adduct and invert the foot, but it also helps uh, with some plantar flexion as well. So by all intents and purposes really, uh, this muscle is a supinator. There are obviously other muscles that help supinate the foot and these include flexor hallucis longus and flexor digitorum longus. So if you remember back to your anatomy days at university, that's your, your Tom, Dick and Harry. But of all these muscles, uh, it's the tib post which has the greatest leverage point around the subtalar joint and also the largest inversion moment arm about that joint. So what this could mean in very sort of crude basic terms uh, is that if the foot is excessively pronating, it's the tib post which is going to cop it the most over the other muscles. So it starts firing an early loading response, uh, then through to terminal stance, and then it carries on firing into early uh, pre-swing. 
Now, regarding causes and pathophysiology, uh, there's various papers, including the one that I quoted here uh, in 1998 by um, Mosier, or Mosier. Um, what they found is that a histological examination has shown that rather than a tendonitis or the tendon being inflamed, the process actually starts with a tendinosis uh, or tendon degeneration. This then becomes fibrotic through a process of repeated microtrauma um, and can eventually lead to a complete rupture over a period of time. Uh, so again there we're seeing, although it's often quoted as a tendonitis, um, actually uh, there's, there's not always inflammation and if there is inflammation, it usually tends to be uh, um, the, the sheath or the parent tendon. And this really ties in um, uh, with the condition really and the progression of it when you look at these classifications. So initially you'd start with uh, like a paratendinitis uh, which would affect just the membrane uh, or a tendinosis as I just explained in the previous slide. Um, so that would be for stage one. In stage two you'd start to get partial tears and more degenerative changes. Uh, by stage three you, you get some actual proper tears and it won't really be functioning as properly, you get a flatter foot appearance and by stage four it's pretty much game over. Right, regarding the etiology um, of this condition, uh, there is still some controversy about the underlying causes and a poor blood supply to the tendon has been identified as a cause um, and that, that they think tends to occur as it goes around the medial malleolus. Uh, mechanical factors, and that's where our orthotics come in, which I'll talk about a bit later, but mechanical fa factors um, almost certainly play a part um, and can predispose the tendon to a progressive fibrosis state. Um, so the most notable one of the um, abnormal forces um, that we're likely to see are probably going to arise from um, uh, excessive pronation, creating a greater mechanical demand on the muscle. Um, and you probably see that more um, than in a foot where the level of pronation wasn't deemed to be excessive. Um, another possible theory is overpull of the opposing peroneus brevis muscle. Um, and then there's also um, some correlations between rupture of the tibialis uh, tendon uh, in association with a traumatic event. So maybe something like an ankle fracture or an ankle sprain um, or a direct blow to the tendon. But they're not particularly common. So um, I think abnormal forces is probably um, one of the most common causes there. Now, when it comes to preventing or slowing down the um, degeneration process, it, it's probably the mechanical factors that we're most interested in. Uh, and there is a growing body of research that supports a correlation uh, between excess pronation and tib post dysfunction. And the graph I've posted here, um, and it's one I did a sort of literature paper review on last month, but it's from a research paper by Merle Menz and Landorf in 2009. And what it shows very, very clearly there is that there is a direct correlation between a flatter foot and the amount of muscle activation of that tibialis posterior muscle. Now, whether the flat foot has caused the tib post to tire and weaken, or whether the tib post weakens for some reason and then causes uh, the flat foot, is a little bit of a chicken and egg scenario. Um, but regardless of which comes first, if you look at the evidence, the two are somehow correlated. And, and I do think that graph sums that up uh, quite nicely. Now, if we look at it in a bit more depth, uh, the tib post tendon plays an important role in shifting uh, the center of pressure anteriorly at heel off. Um, so as during gait, um, as your um, toe off and your heel comes off the ground. Um, so that's how it should work in a normal foot. But if the tendon isn't functioning as it should, um, it causes a posterior shift. So it moves it back and um, a posterior shift of that center of pressure. Um, and that ends up causing secondary abnormal loading on the foot's medial structures, which is probably why they end up weakening and you get that flat foot appearance. Um, having said that, the flat foot deformity may be a predisposing factor to the onset of the tib post tendon dysfunction, so a bit like I said with the chicken and egg. Um, the tendon also um, acts to lock the bones of the mid tarsal joint and the subtalar joints and so that they're stable during heel off. So if you think about your windless mechanism and how all that comes into play, that, that, comes, that plays a part in that as well. Um, a flat foot deformity will compromise the ability um, 
to do that and stabilize that mid-tarsal joint and then that ends up putting even more stress on some of the surrounding uh, ligaments um, and they in turn begin to weaken and degenerate as well. So essentially the worse it gets the more it affects everything else and that's why um, it becomes so progressive. I'm just going to take a mouthful of coffee so hopefully you won't hear me slurping. Right. Now this is a, another factor which is definitely worth mentioning. It's the position of the subtalar joint axis. So if you look at the picture there, uh, the one on the left hand side shows a normalish axis, the one on the right shows a medially deviated axis. Now if your patient has a medially deviated axis, the tib post will have to work a lot harder to prevent the foot from excessively pronating and that's because the lever arm is shorter. Um, so there's two points you can take for this. Um, Firstly, if you pick up a medially deviated axis um, in just in a routine examination, it is likely that your patient may be more predisposed to the condition. Uh, and secondly, if you're treating them with orthoses, you need to make sure that you apply the correction, whether it's posting or skive, um, but you need to make sure that this is applied to the area which is medial of the axis line. Um, if you have it the other side of the axis line, it will effectively push the foot the wrong way, and then you end up sort of skewing the foot in the middle. Um, and getting sort of mid-tarsal pain and all sorts of other aches and pains. Now, I'm not going to go into loads and loads of detail about this. If you want to know more, have a look on the lbgmedical.com website. Look under education and then under past webinars and you'll see one which talks about this um, and explains the medially deviated axis theory. Um, and actually, the example I've used on that previous webinar um, is about tib post dysfunction. So if you want to know more, uh, have a look at that. So middle-aged women are most commonly affected. Um, one paper suggested a prevalence of up to 10% in elderly women and other papers have also suggested that the prevalence increases with age. So pes planus, flat foot, excess pronation, call it what you will, uh, they're all uh, marked in the literature as risk factors and if not a result of the problem. Um, but if it's undiagnosed, um, this might be the first sign that there's a problem. So maybe a patient comes to see you because they've, they began to develop a, a flat foot or a pronated foot, especially if it's unilateral, and then you may end up picking up the problem uh, from that. And then other risk factors, there's hypertension, diabetes, uh, steroids injections, or people that have previously had steroid injections around the tendon, um, obesity. And a paper in 1992 by Holmes and Mann suggested that 60% of patients with TIB post rupture had at least one of these conditions, so hypertension, diabetes, previous steroid injection, and, and obesity. So they're your risk factors. Um, also, you've got your seronegative arthropathies, uh, such as um, ankylizing spongiolitis, uh, Reiter syndrome, psoriatic arthritis, and juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Um, there are a few more as well. Um, and then you have got, as I mentioned this earlier when I talked about the anatomy, there are a few people that have slight anatomical variations. So maybe something like an accessory bone, um, that can alter the leverage and then weaken the tendon, but they tend to be a little bit few and far between. So typically your patient will present with pain and swelling um, of the medial rear foot and they may also report a change in the shape of the foot or a flattening of the affected foot. Uh, the pain tends to be behind the medial malleolus and then along the instep or underneath the arch. Uh, patients also tend to comment that the pain is worse when walking or that they can't walk as far as they used to uh, because of the pain. Now, I've got a few slides here um, about making a diagnosis, but before I go on to that, I want to make a point about uh, how often it's actually missed. So according to this paper, patients whose acquired flat foot is associated with a more generalized medical condition tend to receive their diagnosis and are referred appropriately. However, in patients whose adult acquired flat foot deformity is a result of damaged structure, structures, supporting the medial longitudinal arch, the diagnosis um, is often not made early. So basically, if, if patients are otherwise fit and healthy, the diagnosis can be missed or, um, in some instances, it's misdiagnosed as an ankle sprain or arthritis by GPs. Uh, so it's very, very easy to uh, diagnose, um, but there does need to be more awareness about it. 
Now, because of the, the progressive deformity of this foot condition, early diagnosis is very important. Um, and taking a good history and performing a good, if not relatively simple, examination is the key to getting that diagnosis. So it's something that you could quite easily um, teach to colleagues or other health professionals. So normally, a patient will present initially with tenderness anywhere along the course of the tendon. But as I said before, it's usually between the medial malleolus and the point of the navicular insertion, so where the main bulk of that that tendon inserts. So in stage one, um, your patient will typically present with um, an insidious onset of a vague pain in the medial foot um, and a swelling, or sometimes they get a swelling uh, behind the medial malleolus and along the course of the tendon. Um, and these patients usually have no history of acute trauma, so it will have come on gradually and they probably won't remember exactly when it started. And then as the condition progresses to a stage two, patients have more complaints about loss of function and they might start to notice a change in the shape of the foot. So they'll either say something about um, on one side it's, it's, it's worsening or if they've already got sort of bilateral flat feet or excessively pronating feet, um, they might notice that one foot is becoming sort of flatter than the other one. Uh, the patient may also feel a little bit unstable, start to limp a bit, their walking distance will become less, um, and they'll find walking on hard or, or uneven surfaces more difficult. Um, this sometimes, depending on how long they've had it, uh, because of their gait altering ever so slightly, they then start to become, or they can become more aware of other existing pathologies, so something like bunions or or hallux rigidus or metatarsalgia, um, and it may actually be that the patient comes to see you with their, their um, HAVs, bunions, metatarsalgia, um, and actually that's secondary um, to the dysfunction of the tib post. Um, then in the later stages, in three and four there, um, as the deformity, deformity um, starts to worsen, um, patients have, they, they generally tend to have less pain around the tendon, probably less swelling, um, but they'll end up having more pain around the rear foot, and you could also get an impingement of the fibula on the sinus tarsi, and that could be causing pain as well. So this is a nice little examination. It's a little bit of a crowded um, slide there, but if you, if you watch it again later, you can pause it and make notes if you need to. Um, it doesn't actually take that long, so basically you want your patients um, standing there, weight-bearing in front of you, trousers rolled up so you can see their legs from the knee down, and you want to look at their standing relaxed foot posture, um, have a look um, and see if there's any swelling behind the medial malleolus, palpate along the tib post tendon and see if there's, there's any tenderness. Then you'd want to get your patient to stand on tiptoes, which they may or may not be able to do, um, and if they can, then get them to do, um, if they can, 10 unsupported heel raises on each leg, or, or certainly as many as they can. Um, ask the patient as well when you've got them sitting to bring uh, their foot into an inverted and plantar flex position from an everted and dorsal flex position, but do it against the resistance of your hand uh, and see if that brings on any pain um, and compare it to the good foot as well, because they might not get pain, but you might pick up a weakness in that side. And then have a look at your rear foot movement. So in stages one and two, uh, the foot will be supple um, and the flat foot deformity can be corrected just by inverting the heel. But once that starts progressing and you've got osteoarthritic changes, uh, that movement will be lessened and probably more painful and you might have some ankle arthritis in with that as well. So just going through what you might see with some of those tests, uh, in a stage uh, one uh, tip post dysfunction, you'd start seeing signs of swelling and tenderness behind or below the medial malleolus along the course of the tendon. Um, and also you'd see some um, certainly weakness, if not pain as well, when you invert the foot against resistance. You might also find that the patient has some difficulty rising onto one heel, um, or weakness after multiple heel raises, so maybe they can do, I don't know, one to five, but then after that um, the, the foot gets weak and they, and they find it harder. Um, generally speaking, someone that's fit and healthy should be able to do ten unsupported heel raises fairly easily on each leg. If you're unsure, compare it to the good leg, because perhaps if you've got an elderly, elderly person, they, they wouldn't be able to do it, so for, for a baseline, compare it uh, to the good side. 
Now, if the condition has progressed um, to a deformity, you can see that fairly easily just by looking at the um, standing foot pass posture. So you'd see the medial longitudinal arch is flattened, the heel of being valgus, and you might also see the too many toes sign, which is a result from adduction of the forefoot. Um, actually, a good way to look at standing foot posture is to do the foot posture index, um, and then you get a score with it as well. Um, it's also quite a good thing to do, I guess, if you've got a patient who's been newly diagnosed and then you'd get a foot score for um, the amount of def um, deformation um, and then you could do it, say, I don't know, when you see them six months or so, a year later and you can see if that's got any worse, so it gives you a bit of a benchmark. But if you don't know about the foot posture index, then look it up because it is, is a good one to have in your box of tools. Um, anyway, I digress. Uh, so stages three and four, the patient would probably have less uh, swelling and pain because uh, the, the, the condition has now become chronic, um, but they would probably almost certainly have acquired uh, that flat foot deformity. So if you look at the um, patient, if you stand behind them, you'll see asymmetry or uh, unilateral acquired flat foot deformity with a valgus heel and flattening of the medial longitudinal arch and forefoot abduction. Um, most common functional tests to do, like I just said, is a single heel raise, and, and basically patients with, with tip post dysfunction are um, unable to do this. Uh, okay, so yeah, moving on to stages three and four. Um, in addition to the findings that you get in two, the flat foot, pedor the, the flat foot deformity is probably more likely to have become fixed. Um, and you can examine this just by taking hold of the heel and trying to correct that valgus position of the rear foot and seeing how much range of motion, if at all, is available in the subtalar joint. So there's quite a bit there to go on. Aside from this, there are various different imaging techniques which can be carried out, such as MRI and ultrasound, but that would probably um, do be another presentation in its own right. So normally, um, as I say, if you perform uh, all those things on the examination, then you get a good indication of what your diagnosis is. Okay. Can't move my slide on now for some reason. Oh, there we go. Okay, so I've put a few images in there just so you can see uh, what I'm talking about. So the bottom left picture, um, uh, the, the right foot looks relatively, um, or the calc looks almost sort of perpendicular to the ground. But the left, you can see um, the heel is in quite a valgus position and you can see quite a lot of bulging around the tail and avicular joint there on the medial side. Um, same is true for the big picture on the right. And then looking down the picture at the top there, you can see um, which foot is affected and there's quite a lot of bulging around the mid-tarsal joint and that foot probably underneath would have um, some callus and probably hyperkeratotic uh, tissue um, or skin uh, underneath where, it's, where the arch is just completely on the ground. So that, that's your typical um, presentation once the flat foot deformity um, has started. So, it's, like I said, it's a pretty thorough examination, but you obviously shouldn't rule out a differential diagnosis, um, and there are other conditions to be aware of, and I have listed a few. So, you've got uh, tendinosis of uh, flexor digitorum longus and the um, flexor hallucis longus. Um, it could be a rupture of the calcaneonavicular ligament um, and talionavicular capsule or the spring, spring ligament complex. Could be talionavicular joint osteoarthritis, Liz Frank osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis, oh, I've put an extra O in there, that should be just rheumatoid arthritis, not rheumatoid OA, um, and then you've got your diabetics and peripheral neuropathies as well, but then it, you know, it could come secondary to that, so they're just other things to be aware of. Now there's, there's various treatment options depending on its uh, severity. Uh, conservative treatment would include things like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, rest, uh, immobilization if, if you had an acute inflammation there, um, and orthoses to control uh, the more chronic symptoms and prevent it from worsening over time. Um, and strengthening exercises uh, come into play with that as well. If you looked at surgical treatment in the early stages, you might uh, have something like a rear foot osteotomy combined with a tendon transfer. Um, or an atheresis of the rear foot and occasionally the ankle um, if you're looking at the later stages of the condition. But I'm not going to go into too much um, detail about the surgery, so I'll sooner leave that to someone that knows more about it. 
Now, as a podiatrist, I'm obviously going to want to focus on the um, orthoses side of things. Uh, and in my opinion, I think there's a huge place for them, uh, particularly with this condition. And I blogged about it a while back. But I think really you can get some great results, providing you take everything into account with this. Now, there are lots of papers out there advocating the use of orthoses, but few of them give specific guidelines. And I've put a list underneath there, um, and the references are at the back if you want to look at them. Um, but some of the time, or well, a lot of the time, their methodologies aren't actually that great, which doesn't mean that the orthoses don't work, it's just that they haven't tested them that well. Um, and the second paper there, um, a review by um, Bowring and um, Chocolingham, um, actually found when they looked at all these papers that there was limited and poor quality evidence for the conservative treatment of this condition. Um, and what they concluded was that, th that they couldn't really make a cause-effect relationship between the intervention and the outcome um, because there was, they just um, couldn't come to a, a basically a cold gold standard or a conservative um, treatment regime. So what they found is although there was lots of papers essentially, um, uh, they needed better quality research um, uh, to make uh, a gold standard treatment. Now, having said all that, a paper here, um, or study in 2009, examined the effectiveness of orthoses um, and resistance exercises in the early management of um, TIB post tendinopathy. Um, and they found that people uh, with early stages of TIB post uh, tendinopathy, so stages one and two, uh, actually benefited from a program of wearing orthoses um, and stretching and doing resistive exercises as well. Um, and that was quite a good paper. Now, I, having a look for recent papers, and this is one I came up with, um, it's a recent um, randomized control trial protocol. And basically, it's one that's in the pipeline um, to be done, and it's aimed to give this better evidence that we need. Um, and the reference is there if you want to look it up. So basically, when you read it through, they recognize the benefits of orthoses, but they also recognize um, the lack of good evidence. And they've actually quoted um, the paper I mentioned before uh, by Bowring. So hopefully this will bring us a step closer to a gold standard once they've finished it. But it certainly looks like their methodology is very comprehensive. Um, and that is where the other papers have fallen short. So it's certainly one to keep an eye on there. Now, despite the lack of evidence, um, I have put some orthotic considerations to think about on there. Now, compliance can be a problem. And I've certainly found this in the past, especially in stages one and two, where people are relatively fit and healthy. So it does help to emphasize that, that, that patients that have TIB post dysfunction, it, it helps to explain and educate that it is a progressive and chronic condition. Um, and that sometimes you might need several fittings or seven, several different trials of different orthoses or treatments to find out which is um, tolerable and, and which works best for your patient. But the education about the condition is certainly key there. Now, as we know from our uh, anatomy lectures, that the sub patellar joint moves in the frontal and sagittal and transverse planes, so all three. Uh, the first we can, well, the first two we can address relatively easily with foot orthoses by putting posting on or the inclination underneath the sustum ticulum tali. But the transverse plane is harder, and this is where, um, in more severe conditions, maybe ankle foot orthoses come into play because they help control the sagittal um, transverse plane rather. Um, and failing that, a good pair of ankle boots will, will also work quite well. But you would need the range of motion at the ankle joint and the subtalar joint, so it probably wouldn't work great, well, brilliantly on a, on a stage four. Um, and then, last but not, not least, there's the position of the subtalar uh, joint axis. And it's pretty crucial that you know where this is if you're prescribing an orthosis. Um, basically, all of your correction needs to be on the medial side of the axis. Otherwise, you push the foot the wrong way. And as I said before, if you want to know more about this, look at the past webinar I did about a year ago um, on the LBG medical website. Now, strengthening exercises are also an important part of uh, the treatment program, uh, especially in the early stages, so stages uh, one and two. And there was a paper I found that said uh, closed chain research, um, sorry, closed chain resisted foot adduction exercises have been shown to work well in stage uh, one of tip post dysfunction. And this is because um, you're, you're specifically addressing just the tip post muscle. 
What the paper found, however, though, was as you progress to a stage two and the foot became flatter, the exercises, which I think they measured using, or they used an EMG to see um, uh, how the muscle was activating, but they found that the, the exercises were only effective if there was an arch support worn at the same time. So they were done semi-weight bearing. So basically when the foot is flat, um, the exercises don't work tip post as well as when there's an arch. So if you're thinking about doing this, um, you need to have your patient semi-weight bearing um, and have an orthosis in the shoe to hold the foot um, in its optimum position uh, if you need to. Now, Kulig's study uh, showed that concentric and eccentric loading of the muscle um, in a similar manner to what I've just um, described with the, with the arch support if necessary, uh, they found that this reduced pain and also improved patients' um, perceptions of function. So they actually used a funny machine when they did it. You could probably um, replicate this uh, using TheraBand or referring to a physio. Calf stretches, I always think, are a good thing to do anyway. Um, they're another good exercise to do because the tendon tends to shorten, uh, or the post tip, tip post rather, the tendon shortens as the foot becomes flatter. Uh, and what you find is that if you're and this doesn't just go for tip post dysfunction, this goes for um, a, a, an excessively pronated foot for other conditions as well. But if you correct the position of the foot and you don't address the calf tightness, you can end up causing secondary problems in the midfoot and the forefoot uh, because sometimes the foot will be pronating to compensate for a tight calf. So if they have got tight calves and you're going to start correcting foot positions, then you need to um, address both and you'll get better results with that and probably better compliance because um, you won't get any additional aches and pains. So this is a table that I've just taken out of a paper um, because I think it's a handy care pathway, um, especially if you're working with other health professionals. Now you might not necessarily agree with the box on the bottom left uh, hand corner there which says about referring to a podiatrist or an orthopaedic surgeon for orthoses, uh, but you get the general idea. So I would say NHS practitioners out there, I think your knowledge and education to other health professionals would certainly help catch this condition early and prevent long-term uh, complications. Um, obviously when someone's got to the stage where they've got a rigid flat foot, it's, it's quite a um, uh, quite a, a condition or a disabling condition that has quite an impact on that patient's life. So if it's caught early, obviously you can prevent that. Um, same goes for private practitioners as well. There's a lot of education you can do with this. Um, I mean, I learned about the condition in university and assumed it was well known, but sort of outside of podiatry and physio and orthopaedics, um, it is not always recognised that well. So to bring it to conclusion, and as I said, I'll answer some questions in a minute, um, I think essentially this is a very common condition. It's very often overlooked. Uh, early diagnosis is essential, and we do need to keep an eye on the research for a better idea of how to treat it um, most effectively. So there will be new papers coming out. It's just a case of um, keeping an eye on them and reading them. So there's your references. There's quite there's two pages worth there. Um, if you go on the website and look back through the um, presentation later on, then you can pause on the references if you want to look any of them up. So, any questions? So, I've got one there already. Yeah. Oh, I've lost the questions now. Where have they gone? Oh, there we go. Um, okay, someone's put risk factors, hypertension. Um, I've got absolutely no idea. I'd have to go and look it up. Um, I'm not sure why this is a risk factor. It was just in, in the paper that I was looking at. It, it named it as a risk factor. Um, somebody else has put, do you find this is an acute uh, condition or does it tend to develop over time? Uh, usually it tends to develop over time and I think that's why it tends to get missed because it ends up starting as a little niggle and people think it's not really worth going to the doctor or to see a podiatrist. Um, 
so yes, it tends to start slowly. Sometimes it can be acute, especially if you, if you have got an inflammation, but, but yeah, normally over time. Somebody else has also asked why hypertension is a risk factor. Um, what is your experience of using an AFO or a Ritchie brace? And what's the outcome? It, um, they work um, brilliantly well if you've got the right patient and if they're happy to accommodate their footwear or wear um, well-supporting uh, footwear to put it in. Um, if you've got the patient on side, they do work very, very well, particularly if you've got um, a really excessively um, pronated foot, uh, but it's still flexible enough to move it back into a better position, then yes, they do work well. Ooh, hang on. Is there an increased prevalence of this condition in hypermobile patient, patients? Ooh, hang on. And is the management more challenging? Um, I don't know if there's an increased prevalence. Normally with hypermobile patients, um, you probably see both feet were excessively pronated, so you'd be probably treating um, both of them equally. But I don't know if the prevalence would be more or less, probably about the same as the general population, I would think. But, uh, Do you know of any correlations between muscle testing and orthotic characteristics um, as medial sky properties? Um, there's quite a lot of papers that look at this. Um, certainly if you're looking at the medially deviated axis um, and how the forces um, act. And then um, I mean, really you're looking at papers that have looked at EMG activity. So, but yeah, there are plenty out there. Uh, that's a good question. What do you think about proximal control factors like poor gluteal control um, and trans uh, control in the rehab of um, uh, TIB post patients? I'm not sure what the research is like for that. Um, I didn't find anyone I was looking. I've got to be perfectly honest. Um, I would probably get a physio to do that because they're, um, they'd be stronger in that area than I would. But I'm all for um, looking above just treating the foot because um, proximal does have an effect on, on distal and distal does have an effect on proximal and there's lots of research to support that. So yeah, if I got good results with that, um, I'd, I'd be happy to give that a go. Uh, strong hiking boots work well too. What about any um, strapping options? Um, there are taping options where you can replicate what the uh, tip post is doing. The only thing with that is you've got to either keep doing it for the patient or they've got to learn to do it. Um, and when you think it's a progressive condition, do they really want to be taping it from now and for the next goodness knows how many years? So it might work well initially if they've, if they've got a, um, an immediate pain, but you'd be wanting for a more long-term solution, I would have thought. But yeah, hiking boots work well. Uh, and yes, you could use a walker boot. Uh, to offload and immobilize the foot in the acute cases just until it settles down or the inflammation has gone down. Um, yet someone else has asked about low eye taping. Yes, it can certainly be useful because you're imitating or you're, you're trying to replicate what the muscle's doing. Um, but again, you've got to think about what your long-term management would be for that patient. Oh, there we go. Someone said, oh, thank you very much, Andy Rozell. How are you? Um, hypertension because of negative vascular effects, um, increased chance of localized necrosis, probably. And actually, that ties in with one of the other um, risk factors, which said about poor blood supply. So yeah, probably the two are tied in. So thank you. Hope you're all working hard down there in West Sussex, rather than sitting around listening to me drinking tea. <laughs> Yeah, other than clinical signs, are there any scans that would help to um, identify it? I mean, you've got MRIs, you've got ultrasound, um, all the usual scans, 
but I mean you wouldn't send them for a scan if you didn't have a suspicion about what it was anyway probably so Right. Are there any guidelines on the frequency and loading for strengthening exercises? Your best bet is to read that paper uh, that I just mentioned by um, Kulig uh, in 2009. Um, and if you read that through, um, they talk about what loading um, they put on there and how they load for the eccentric and concentric exercises. Um, I think they found the eccentric ones they could put higher loading rates on, but this was only one paper um, that I found that in. Um, all the other papers were a little bit vague on what you actually did, but um, if you read that paper, it might give you um, a little bit of an indication if you're interested in, in doing that. Okay, which other muscles try to compensate? Uh, Clamby, your flexor digitorum longus, your flexor hallucis longus, they'll try and compensate as well if you post tips playing up. And also the smaller ligaments um, connecting those joints down there. Oh, that's an interesting one. Um, do you think the hill lift test is definitive? Also, any ideas um, why some patients can perform it if they flex the knee as they attempt to lift the heel? Um, I didn't know that, um, and I've got absolutely no idea. I think the heel lift test is one of those things um, that historically that's what we've always done, but I don't think the research is that good for it. Um, but I think generally because you're using the tib post muscle to, to lift yourself up when you lift the heel, it's sort of a fairly good indicator, but I'm not entirely sure how well researched that is. I, mean, I certainly didn't find any papers on it um, when I was doing it, um, looking through the research to do this presentation. But flexing the knee, um, I suppose you're releasing the gastrox. I don't know if that would have an effect. I don't see why it would. Um, unless if they're flexing the knee, they're holding on to something at the same time and that's helping. Um, but essentially the other thing you'd want to look at with the, um, the heel lift test is whether the calc is inverting as well. And even if they found it easy, if they were flexing the knee, um, if the post tip or the tip post wasn't working well, then the heel um, wouldn't invert, or certainly not as well um, as it would on the, on the other foot. And um, Andy's put there again, Richie braces work very well in the late stages of um, stage two and early stage three in my experience. Um, that sounds about right really because usually in stage one um, the foot hasn't progressed to a flat foot deformity as much as it would have done in stage two um, and stage three. And someone's put, in your experience, um, how effectively can you manage symptoms at a stage seven? But I think that might be a typo and it might be a stage four. Um, to prevent progression, or is it just that you slow the rate of progression? Uh, or was that meant to be? A, oh, no, sorry. My screen's really scored small. You put a stage one stroke two. Um, I think a lot of that comes down um, to how... Um, how compliant your patient is as well. So if you can get them into a good pair of orthoses, um, you can get them doing strengthening exercises, you can get them wearing um, adequate footwear, uh, things like walking boots as previously mentioned, then you could certainly um, slow down uh, the progression. Um, but if you've got someone that wears orthoses to come to your appointment and does their stretching exercises only when they've just left your appointment, um, then that progression is probably um, going to go a lot faster. I think that's really when you need things like your foot posture index, um, because then you can you can mark and sort of map how how much worse it's getting um, and to to what rate it's progressing as well. But I would say that almost certainly comes down to your management, um, but also your patient compliance. That's just as important. Yeah, is the 10 unsupported heel raises um, part of the test you describe evidenced? Uh, I mean, it's it's quoted in research papers, but it's not quoted as to how that was worked out, if that makes sense. 
So um, as I said earlier, I think it's one of those things that we do historically, but I'm not entirely sure that someone's done a specific study uh, looking at that. Um, and then we've got, do you agree that footwear advice is crucial, um, soft comfort shoes, wobbly fitness shoes and converse type are not usually helpful? Um, absolutely, and I probably should have mentioned that more in, in the presentation. Yeah, if they're going to be wearing slip-on shoes or your, your dolly pumps and those sort of things, and you're trying to stick an orthosis in there and get them to do exercises, then you're really going to compromise what you're trying to do. So yeah, footwear advice is absolutely crucial, and if you can get them in walking boots, then all the better. Um, and then we've got, how would you go about treating um, tip post dysfunction in patients with tibial varum? The elastic phase of loading would be greatly affected. If you're asking all the awkward questions, Edward, <laughs> um, I honestly wouldn't know um, if that would be affected or not. As I said, all the, um, certainly from a clinical experience and certainly from the papers I've looked at, it doesn't really go into those kind of anatomical or biomechanical variations. I suppose that's the trouble as well, we get so focused on just looking at the foot, just looking at that muscle, we don't always take into consideration um, what else is going on. But yes, I guess it would be, um, the elastic phase probably would be um, affected, but I don't know to what degree that would be, and I don't think there's any research on it. So if you've got any um, clinical tips there, then that would be great. And then Andy's put there as well, US, which I think is, means ultrasound, is very useful in the early, um, in the disease, as you can see the thickening associated uh, with the tendinosis. I think you've got an ultrasound machine down there, haven't you? It's boys and their toys. Um, but yeah, no, ultrasound is very helpful um, if you've got access to it. Uh, what kind of strengthening exercise would you recommend? Um, uh, probably with the um, foot semi-weight bearing um, and using a TheraBand to adduct and abduct the foot. So you're loading eccentric and eccentrically and concentrically. Um, again, if you're interested in there, look at that paper by uh, Kulig. Uh, that gives some indications about repetitions and so on and so forth. Uh, the only thing I would say is that you wouldn't want, um, every patient is different and you wouldn't want them probably pushing it, pushing it through the pain, so it would be as much as they could tolerate to do and then probably building it up as it gets stronger. Um, then, yeah, Edward, you've rephrased that. No, I did get what you mean. Um, with the reduced elastic loading phase of the tip post tendon in um, a tibial varum, um, affect your level of intervention or prescription? I think if I'm perfectly honest, I'd have to trial and error with that one. I, I honestly don't know.
Oh, that's interesting. And um, that's coming back to um, Helen's comment about flexing the knee. Um, if the patient um, flexed at the knee to lift their heel, um, they're not actually plan to flexing at the ankle, so it will be a false positive. Yeah. I think I'll have to um, have a go at doing heel raises later to, to try and work that one out. But yes, you'd be probably looking at different muscle activation with that. Um, regarding orthoses, often patients find firm orthoses cause soreness around the navicular. Um, any pearls of wisdom, um, are a orthotic advice or selection for that? Uh, I'd probably try a navicular drop test with that. Um, and it may be that you need something which is controlling more in the transverse plane. So I wonder if a softer orthosis, um, maybe a medium density EVA, even though that's not going to um, add as much control because it's softer, but I wonder if you use that in conjunction uh, with a walking boot um, and then you, you're controlling it in the transverse plane um, uh, as well as the other two as well, so that might work. But yeah, certainly um, if you stick a very hard polyprop um, device underneath and they've got more um, movement in the navicular, then it can rub and cause soreness. And then someone's put, um, can the degeneration, degeneration be halted in the early stages if caused by trauma, like from a high impact? Um, therefore, the need for orthoses may only be temporary. Um, yes, quite possibly, because it's not the other factors which are causing it. And, and you'd assume that um, once you'd healed the tendon, if there were no other problems, then they probably could just go back to um, doing whatever they were doing before and not, not need orthoses um, forever, so to speak. A high impact sports injury. Yeah, because that, that I mean that's your cause. You're not wondering, oh, is it um is it hypertension or is it diabetes or is it because they're over a certain age or any other reason, you know exactly what's caused that and it is your high impact injury. So once it's healed, I mean whether you've um immobilized it or, or whatever, once that's healed and once you've had some rehab to get back to normal, then um yeah, you certainly wouldn't or you certainly probably wouldn't um uh, want to carry on with orthoses forever. And then yeah, Ed was just put there, me too. So yeah, if you find out, if you get a patient like that, do let me know because I'd be quite interested. I always find patients going off the track a little bit. Patients with um, tibial varum always, it seems to change everything anyway. And I noticed that when I was looking at a lot of medial tibial stress syndrome, um, how that changed sort of the norm of what you'd normally do. Uh, because of that, basically because they, they just ended up having more loading on the tibia. So anyway, I digress. Uh, any evidence that stretching the tib post um, as an exercise therapy is helpful because physios seem to prescribe this? I think I'd probably ask them what their evidence for it was. Um, certainly um, everything I found looked towards um, strengthening exercises rather than stretching. Um, the only um, thing I would have thought for that is that you want to stretch it after you've um, sort of done your loading exercises. But I don't know why they would prescribe that um, above anything else, so it might be worth asking them. In fact, I, um, Helen, I'd have a look through that um, link I put on there. Uh, where is it? Well, it's not a link. It was I put the um, reference on there for that um, uh, RCT that's going to be carried out. And if you see a lot of posted patients, and that is quite an interesting paper to read, albeit a bit, it took me a while to get my head around it a little bit. Um, but it'd be certainly interesting to see what they find when they actually publish that research, because that looked a lot about um, the exercises. And the general consensus seems to be in the, in the good research which has come out lately is that orthoses work really well, but they work in conjunction with um, strengthening and stretching exercises. So have a look at that and um, see what you make of it. Uh, 
And then someone's put a comment, um, just a comment rather than a question. I find rigid or semi-rigid orthoses um, with a high medial phalange and sometimes a small del for the navicular pressure work well and are tolerated just as well as EVA. Um, yeah, I can see why that would work. Again, you'd need a good footwear accommodation if you've got a medial flange. But then if you think about it, your medial flange is effectively um, trying to control the subtalar joint in the transverse plane. Um, so like I was saying before, um, if you do your navicular drop test where you get more transverse um, or more moving side to side than moving up and down, um, they would probably be the patients that um, that would work best for because you're controlling uh, the transverse plane. Um, and then we've got pain um, on the course of the um, tip post um, with a unilateral heel raise in children. Um, what is your differential diagnosis? Uh, I've got to be honest, I probably have to go and look that up. I haven't treated children for a while. Um, I think with children, you always have to be thinking about the neurological side of things as well. So if you had that problem and it wasn't just related, or you had a hinkling that it wasn't just related to the tip post tendon, I think you'd want to be doing your neurological checks with that as well. Um, and also looking at your milestones and that sort of thing. So children sort of have their own probably set of differential diagnoses and things that you should be checking for. Uh, as I say, tip post dysfunction isn't something you'd, you'd necessarily see in children. So I'd probably be looking at what else could be going on there. Right, any more questions or are we done now? Thanks, Ellen. Thank you. Oh, thanks for all your nice comments. Thank you. I still must admit, even though I've done a few of these now, I still find it really, really hard just sitting here in my living room, looking out the window, talking to a presentation with no one else in the room, knowing that there's about 100 or people listening. It's really quite a bizarre, um, quite a bizarre thing to do. Yeah, and thanks, Andy. See you again soon. Yeah, if anybody's got any um, ideas or suggestions for the next um, webinar, uh, that or anything that you'd like us to look at, then we're, we're open to suggestions.